Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron LeGrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Well, hello, everybody. This is Ron LeGrand with another episode of the Mentor Podcast, meant to help you make more money, help make it faster, keep it, and retire wealthy. Today, we have another in the series of the Q&A podcast that we've designed for you to be able to submit me questions, and I'll answer them on the entire podcast. So far, this thing has been a smash hit, so let's get going. Okay. Our favorite, favorite questioner, uh, Mary Ann Nunez. I don't know how we could do this without Mary Ann. Mary Ann sends in more questions than anybody, so uh, yeah. we, we love getting questions from Mary Ann. If I sign an agreement with a seller for either a lease purchase or seller finance, is that when I need to call the HOA to ask if they'll allow me to sell on lease option? I'd call them before I sign the agreement, Marianne. Because if you can't lease option it, what are you going to do with it? Now, there is one thing you can do with it. If you buy it with owner financing, you can always sell it with owner financing. HOA can't stop you from doing that. But you need to know that going in. Yeah. And of course, if you're, if you're buying it on a lease purchase, then of course you'd be able to sell it on a lease purchase as well. Uh, no, not if the HOA prohibits putting a tenant in the house. Now your seller will know the answer to that question. And if they don't ask them to find out, you don't have to call them, ask them to find out and you can verify it before you close. So you could, so you're saying you could buy it on a lease purchase without, as long as you don't occupy it, you just would never want to do that though, right? The problem with the HOA is they prohibit the lease purchase. So regardless of how you control the house, you can't put a tenant buyer in it. Right. That's that's not all HOAs now. Most of them do not have that provision. Okay. Marianne Marianne gave us a lot. She wanted to get all of her questions in. So we've got a few. All right. All right. Uh, Because LLCs in California cost $800, I called a company regarding using a registered agent to handle an LLC in Alaska. I was told Alaska is one of the four states which provides the same protection to single-member LLCs as other states do to multi-member LLCs, and creditors are prohibited from ac- accessing the assets of either single- or multi-member LLCs. Do you know if this is true? No, I do not, and I doubt it. If you're living in California, if you have a dispute in California, you're probably going to be forced to deal with California rules, but I do not know that. Because I've been in similar disputes like that, and it's case by case. Because you're using an Alaska operating agreement that is in your favor, and you may be able to force it under Alaska law, but that could go either way, Marianne. <clears throat> so um, you might want to consider not having a solely owned LLC. You must know other people you want in it, children, grandchildren, or whatever. Um, just have more than one entity owning it and you're much better protected. But if it is a solo LLC, don't let too much assets go into it. Um, is there, a, if you have a multi-member LLC, is there a minimum amount, um, like a share that they have to have? <laughs> I've got a couple with half, half of percent share owners. Okay. So if I mean, just yeah. a small price to pay for that additional, uh, protection. Yeah. Huh? yeah. But if you got kids, you need to get them in there anyway. I mean, it's the perfect place to put them. Uh, they're part of your family. They're part of your assets. Uh, keep in mind now, anybody you put in this thing is also subject to whatever percentage of taxes this thing generates. So if it makes a lot of money, you know, they're going to get a tax bill for their little share. But hey, you could always pay the taxes on that share if you needed to, like for your children. And you got to make distributions to them. So if um, I got two kids, each own a half a percent, and I take out a draw, I got to cut them a check for their prorated share of that draw of a, whatever a half a percent is. Now, in my case, if I cut the check, I'm going to have them sign it back to me for rent anyway. <laughs> no, no big deal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ain't getting free money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you also know if this is true or false that if I have an LLC in Alaska to use to do deals with properties in California and someone wants to sue me, I'm not protected because the property is not in Alaska? Well, that's the same answer I just gave you, actually. You can have an LLC in one state that owns properties in other states. I have one, okay? But you're asking me about a state law. I can't give you an answer on it. That's an attorney question. So, uh, and by the way, I'd make it a California attorney question. Again, you can 
sue and try to get the venue to be Alaska, uh, but it's going to be case by case. What if your contract or whatever you're fighting over says that the venue is California? Uh, you're going to be trying this thing in California, most likely. Okay. All right. Next question from Marianne is when we do an owner finance deal with a seller with zero down and we want to close before finding a buyer, you say that we pay the closing costs. So do you also tell the seller that when the tenant buyer is ready to cash out sometime in the future, the seller doesn't pay any of those closing costs also? Mar Marianne, you should never have a conversation with your seller about a tenant buyer. That should never come out of your mouth. Uh, look, you're there to buy their house. They don't need a seminar on what you're going to do with it after you buy it. This is where people get in trouble. They yak too much, flap, 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 talk too much. Just shut up. There should be no conversation about a tenant buyer unless the seller brings it up. And then you say, well, I'm going to put somebody in there and ultimately get them cashed out. That's the end of that conversation. All right. So the answer to your question is when you sell to them, the tenant buyer is usually going to pay all the closing costs anyway. So it has nothing to do with your seller. And by the way, I, I almost always close the purchase before I find a tenant buyer because I want to protect the deal. If it's a good deal, I want to own it as fast as I possibly can. Every day that goes by is a day you stand to lose that property if you don't get it closed and own it. If I got to come out of pocket, I'm going to. And I do because I paid a closing cost. Whatever it takes, I want to buy it if I know it's a deal. Only if I don't know it's a deal because the numbers scare me some way uh, or you know, payments are really high or whatever. Then I'll go find the tenant buyer first on my 90-day plan where I got to find a tenant buyer before I close. But I, honestly, um, I only use that in extreme cases, uh, and, I, and I haven't used it in quite a while. I just rather close it and own it, and then I'm in total control of it, plus I get to depreciate it. And uh, now i got an asset that will produce income for a long time, and uh, I've built a golden goose. I'll go worry about getting a tenant buyer in there later. Hey, worst case, guys, I know some of you worried about getting a tenant buyer in there. Hey, come on, tell me you can't rent a house <laughs> to cover the payment. If covering the payment is what you're concerned about, quit being concerned about it because you're wasting a lot of deals. All right. Uh, next question is from Methodios um, in New York. Okay. When, uh, when starting out and first creating a land trust, can you be the beneficiary and the trustee? No. Beneficiary has to be different than the trustee. Now, don't get me wrong. Your LLC can be the trustee and you can be the beneficiary, which is the way most of mine are. So uh, your LLC is not you. Now, some states don't allow LLCs to be trustees. It has to be an individual. And if that were the case, then just get some other individual. But no, you cannot be both. Okay. Uh, can you recommend any companies that create land trusts? Yeah, you. <laughs> I recommend you get to my training and then you'll see how you'll be laughing at that question. <laughs> in fact, you can uh, get that information uh, at my boot camp. You can get it in my terms course. You can get it in that structuring your empire class. In fact, in that class, we literally wrote up a trust while we're here in the class. <laughs> when you see how simple it was, I think there's five or six questions you got to answer uh, on a deed and five or six more on the trust agreement. You record the deed, you go file a trust agreement in your filing cabinet, and you have formed a trust. It's really, really that simple. In fact, there's lessons on the Gold Club site, aren't there, Nick? Yeah, search yeah. for land trust, and you'll find a lot of lessons on land trust yeah. and uh, documents, everything you need. Yeah. All right. Uh, second question is, um, in subject to deals, one of the risk I is the due on sale clause. Do you suggest to use the land trust to make the breach of the due on sale clause less obvious? It doesn't matter. If you buy the property in a land trust, you have uh, breached the due on sale clause. But that's true no matter how you buy it, except for all cash, because the loan's paid off. Whether it be owner financing or subject to, the due on sale clause could be called due. Fortunately, it probably won't be. And uh, rarely is it ever. Banks don't want houses as long as somebody's making the payments on them. But taking title in the trust doesn't disguise anything. And I think what he's talking about is can we have the seller put the property in a trust yes. and then assign the trust to us? And that is a question that, frankly, I've never heard a good solid answer to because here's why. 
Now, if uh, the seller were selling me the property, regardless of how he's selling to me, it would trigger due on self law. But he's not selling me the property. He's selling me the personal property, which is the beneficial interest of the land trust. <laughs> so I don't know, to tell you the truth. I don't worry about it anyway, because I don't care what the banks do. They don't run my life for me. And I'm in total control if I'm not personally guaranteed a debt to them. Um, but uh, that's, the only thing, that's the only advice I can offer you on that. In fact, I, I, I hope you get in trouble on that so you can litigate <laughs> it and come back and tell me what the answer is. <laughs> Have some precedence there, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've got enough arrows in my back. Your turn. <laughs> All right. He, he does uh, go on um, about paying transfer taxes that way, too, or avoiding paying transfer taxes. So in well, addition, can the land trust prevent the transfer fees or revenue stamps? All right. And, well, yeah, uh, many investors have had the seller put it into a land trust, which means you, there are no transfer taxes and then transfer that trust to you. But I got to tell you, uh, it's likely you're going to get a bill from the county maybe a year later. But. Uh, they're probably going to want their transfer tax. But on the other hand, got the same thing. They say they transfer the trust to you. They transfer personal property. It wasn't real property. See, the trust still owns the house, no matter who owns the trust. So I, there's a case to be made there that you could avoid them, but you'd probably have to litigate it. Okay. And if anybody uh, finds any actual litigation on that subject, I'd like to get it myself. All right. So um, so the seller feels at ease. Let me try saying that five times faster, Ron. Mm -hmm. So the seller feels at ease. Can you use two insurance policies to help keep the deed transfer discreet? Most of the time, the lender finds out about the deed transfer when the insurance notifies them. That's just not true. <laughs> First of all, that's that's a myth. <laughs> Look, you can do whatever you want, but if you've got two insurance policies on a house, one of them is not going to pay off. And if you try to collect on both of them, you're breaking the law and they got prison sentences for that. It don't work that way. When you buy a house, the seller's insurance is going to get killed. It is no longer valid. And when the title changes, that seller, that insurance is gone. So if somebody wants to keep paying on it, God bless them. But there's, there's really dumb to do that. So when you buy a house, you have to put a non-owner occupied policy on it. And the lender has to be notified and named as the mortgagee. That does not trigger the due on sale clause. There is no insurance department here and call the loan due department here at a bank. In fact, most of the time, there's multiple states apart. They don't, it don't work that way. And a bank is not going to call a loan due without a reason. And then, you know, comes, let me train you, and I'll probably convince you that they ain't going to call it due even if they think they got a reason. I can stop them cold. Just don't worry about all that crap. All right. Yeah, the next question continues into that. What happens if you're honest and let the lender know? Um, this, is, this is big here. So what do you guarantee to the seller? Other than the payments, do you also guarantee if the bank calls a loan due that you'll refinance? I am not guaranteeing anything. And if I catch you guaranteeing it, I'm going to come smack you, personally beat the crap out of you with a big board and draw blood. And it won't be mine. Guaranteeing debt is the biggest mistake you can make in real estate. That's a no. You do not guarantee debt and you do not refinance. If you refinance, you got to guarantee the debt. Not in the single family house business. Absolutely not. So we don't guarantee debt. We buy them in a land trust. The trustee signs the note as trustee. There's no liability to the trustee. There's no liability to the beneficiary. Therefore, the only thing that's liable is the house for the note. Don't pay the note. They foreclose on the house. Not you. You don't own the house. They foreclose on the land trust that owns the house. Well, okay. The only thing in the land trust is the house. This is how we keep from actually guaranteeing debt. Now, we're talking about owner financing deals here. Understand that. You're not going to go to the bank and borrow money in a land trust and not guarantee debt. So stay out of banks. That's the smart thing to do. And if you go in them, just don't go on the carpet where the loan officers are. And nowadays, you can't go in them anyway. So good. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they keep them closed. <laughs> I thought that question might get you going, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And his last question is, in lease options, what happens since the owner still holds title to the property um, if he incurs a financial problem and a lien is placed on the property? Well, if a lien is placed on the property, it's his responsibility to clean it up. If he doesn't, he's in breach of contract. I think you're probably over worrying about things like that, but it could happen. Uh, but then again, you have a valid agreement that you can enforce by law. It comes down to that. But it is totally the seller's responsibility to fix that problem. It's not yours. 
Now, it might become your problem if you've got a tenant buyer ready to cash you out. But if that's the case now and he can't fix it, you got some damages. You can sue for damages. So, you know, it's case by case. But, man, the things people worry about, eh? Yeah. you got about as good a chance of that happening as a jet falling out of the air and hitting you right in the head. <laughs> All right, Ron, I just want to let you know we're, we're only about a quarter of the way through the questions right now. So, Okay, so you're telling me to talk about the pace. <laughs> All right. All right. Paul says, uh, does your IRA have to be a self-directed Roth for someone to use for real estate deals? When yes. Put the money back in it. Does it need to be a Roth IRA to be tax free? Yes. Um, same for a 401k? Yes. Okay. That's short enough? Short enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, Darlene from Maryland. Is it a good time to put my home in a trust so I can buy a home from my mom and I to reside while I use her home and my home? which I still owe a mortgage on as rental property. Putting your property into a trust affects none of the things you just said. Uh, it does not going to affect you tax wise. It's not going to relieve you of liability on that mortgage. So I'm not sure I understand the question beyond that, but it's always a good thing to put your property into a land trust, regardless of what your, it's your residence or any other kind of property uh, for several reasons. Go on Oak club site and pull up some land trust, uh, 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 lessons and start learning about land trust. They're so much simpler than people think they are. All right. Uh, next question is from Charlie in North Carolina. Um, he posted an ad. Uh, he didn't post it. He he in his question he showed an ad of a fix and flip investor looking to get their investment cash back. Yeah. Um, on a house. So, uh, what is the best way to approach these sellers, or should I just stay away from them? Are they a waste of time? Stay away from who? What did I miss? So. Um, he sees a lot of uh, ads for like, you know, a three, two house recently remodeled. So these are yeah. basically people who rehabbed and are yeah. now retailing these yeah. houses. Yeah. You're wasting your time with those. You're wasting your time. They want to cash out of them. They're just rehabbers. Okay. All right. Uh, Michael from Missouri. Uh, I have bought subject to many years ago and recently I've been buying flips and rentals. Uh, regarding subject to has anything changed in the last 10 years? I was recently told by, the leaders of our local RIA, um, that subject to investing is now riskier, but no reason why. Uh, that's probably because they took a lesson from me. And it's not any more riskier than it always has been. It's just that my attitude has changed on it. And when my attitude changes, it goes all the way down <laughs> into a lot of other places. And uh, here's the deal. When you take a loan subject to, you're just simply taking over the debt, not guaranteeing it. But the seller has no way to recapture the house if you don't pay. They're putting their credit in your hands, which is one thing, but they have no way to get the house back. So that's one thing, because you're not creating any debt to the seller. If you buy it on a wraparound mortgage, deed of trust, or land contract, or some other device like that, you owe, your trust owes the seller money. If you don't pay that money, the seller can foreclose and get the house back if you make them, okay? But if I buy a house subject to, I owe the seller nothing. There is no land contract. There is no uh, wraparound mortgage. There's nothing for the seller to foreclose on. I have just orally agreed to start paying their bank on their loan that stays in their name. So they have no way to get it back. But probably more importantly, if I buy a house subject to from a seller, and they have a $2,000 a month payment, that's going to stay on their credit. But now they got no way to prove that they got an income to wash out that payment because I bought it subject to, I don't owe them any money. So, but if I buy a house on a wraparound mortgage, then they have a debt instrument that's recorded on public records that says I'm paying them $2,000 to wash out the 2000 that they're paying. So it shouldn't kill their debt ratio. Some banks want that to seize in a while. But, uh, but it don't, will not stop them from going and qualifying for another loan. Okay. Don't it cost any more to do a wraparound than it does a subject to anyway. Let's just do it so we don't have comebacks later from the seller who really didn't understand what you're doing to them. All right. Uh, he continues. He said, when I did it in the past, I closed with a real estate attorney and had my CYA disclosure for the seller and buyer. I was told that in Missouri and Kansas, land trusts are not legally recognized. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, well, that's not true. But in fact, I had a house in Missouri. Guess how I owned it? <laughs> in a land trust. And that attorney said the same thing until we proved that was baloney. 
Uh, be careful to whom you listen. But look, if land trusts are your biggest problem, just go ahead and take title in LLC. I don't care. I mean, I'm not going to go through all that now. Go get my structure in your empire course. And we go through all of that with an attorney sitting right beside me. By the way, I just got a message here. Uh, that, that course is normally $9.97. Uh, they can get it for $4.97 today, Nick, if they call into the, our office. Um, wow. Like somebody, so, yeah, ever make Maybe. sure somebody, somebody notifies them, huh? Okay, you know that course is only fourteen ninety seven, right, Ron? Well, it's four ninety seven today. That's all okay. I know. All right. Um, let's see, it says I used I used that in the past and would transfer the deed to the XYZ Family Trust. Um, I also always got a limited power of attorney that covered the specific property and allowed for insurance and taxes. All right. Well, stop. Okay. I understand. Thousands of deals are done subject to every day. They're still done every single day. I get it. Okay. But um, I'll say again, most of the time, the seller doesn't know the ramifications of that until later down the road, they actually want to go get a loan. Now, the loan's going to stay in their name regardless. Got that. That's the CYA letter. They got to understand that. But uh, to avoid comebacks later, I'm just telling you, if you do a wrap, at least they got some income to show they lo- that washes out their debt. And they got recourse if you don't pay. And um, in fact, many attorneys will not close a subject to deal for that reason. All right. Um, I'm going to skip over the rest of the uh, subject to stuff here. Um, All right. He's got one last thing. Kansas City is right on the state line. So I will be investing in both Missouri and Kansas. Mm-hmm. Also, I assume you can make your trustee your LLC. I can. Yes. You mean my LLC, the trustee? Yeah. The answer is yes, but you need to verify it because half the states require an individual. So I wonder if those half split along Missouri and Kansas. Uh, uh, they have this thing called Google. Yeah. Go to Google. All right. Um, here's an out of the country uh, question from David in Jerusalem. I live in Israel and I want to know if it's possible to do deals without setting foot in the States. David, the answer is yes. Many people do. But then there's money transfer rules that you're going to have to explore. And I can't possibly comment on what that would be for folks living in Israel. Okay. Uh, Jessica in New York says, I'm in my 20s and started with you this year in January and got on board slowly. And now I have a contract on a house in Montgomery, New York. Uh, He originally was going to give it to me below asking price, but with 11% interest. Um, But just having conversation with him and after I ran numbers, Mm -hmm. I went with the lease option, no money down and no interest. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to give him asking price though, but it's okay. He didn't believe it himself the next day. Um, asking price 290 K and at least for three years needs to be staged and painted. Also, I was thinking about splitting the property because it's sitting on 2.6 acres of land. What do you think I should do? Give it to me raw, Ron. Okay. Well, first of all, no way he's ever going to get 11% out of me. So you conquered that nut. On the other hand, why are you giving him full retail price, especially when it needs some work? I'm very reluctant to see you do work on somebody else's property. And at least purchase because it means you do not own the property and you cannot split it. Now, you could split it if you're actually selling off part of it to pay him off and getting him out of the way and own the rest of it free and clear. Uh, You can do that. But uh, that's as far as you can go until somebody's ready to pay off that underlying uh, amount you owe him on that lease option. Again, I, I just wouldn't have given him retail price for it, to tell you the truth. I, I would have arrived at a number that I could give him and hand it to him and let him come back to, back to me when he's ready to say yes, because he would say yes, especially if it needs that work you're talking about. Think about it. If it needs that kind of work, then what owner-occupant is he going to sell it to or maybe even rent it to? So you're in the driver's seat. Just tell him what you can do. I'm telling you, you should see some of these commercial deals I'm doing here. I make an offer called a letter of intent. They come back and they want to raise it. I go back and say, no. Most of the time, the next day, they say, okay, my seller's agreed. Well, guess what? I don't care if they agree or they don't agree. If they don't agree, I got other things to do. I got a whole pile of properties that I'm working on. And that's the key. You cannot be working on one house and have it run your life. You need a stack of deals and not so any one of them won't matter that much. And it puts you in the driver's seat mentally. It, it, it Mentally, it makes you come to the conclusion. It's just another deal. You don't like it? Okay, I'll move on. I'm not saying you can't negotiate a little bit back and forth, but 
uh, you've got to draw the line and have a reason to do business. So now you got this thing under contract. How are you going to make money on it if you're paying retail price? Uh, I don't know, unless there's a good monthly spread in it. Because now you've got to raise it above retail. How are you going to do that if it needs this work? All right, that's all I can input on that one. Better get to train. Better get to my boot camps, what you ought to do. All right. Extremely cheap compared to some of the lessons some of you are going to take trying to avoid it. Yeah. Uh, Maria from New Hampshire says, can I use the purchase and sale agreement in the Pretty House course for a small commercial deal? The 180 grand. Yeah, but you should be running it by an attorney first anyway, uh, once. But yeah, you can. In fact, I've done many small commercial deals with that contract. Okay. She says the seller owns it free and clear and will own her finance. Um, and if so, are there any changes to it? And like you said, run it past an attorney. Uh, you haven't told me what kind of commercial. There is more due diligence to do with commercial than there is with residential. I'm worried more about that than what contract you use. Okay. Uh, Maria's next question. If a seller agrees to terms, but will only agree to two years to own or finance a property with a good amount of equity, would going to the bank to do a refinance after the two years be a good backup plan? Uh, you didn't, you didn't, mean, you didn't mean to ask me that, did you? <laughs> I don't, I, I think it was a, a typo. If I catch you going to a bank to refinance, I'm telling you, I'm going to hurt you. We don't do that. However, if you, uh, have to be pinned down to two years, well, first of all, that means you need a little practice in negotiating because they ain't pinning me down in two years. I'll tell you that right now. But if you have to be pinned down, all you, what you're now looking for is a buyer who can cash you out of the house. So that means you're going to have to look for a buyer that can qualify, uh, maybe fix a little something first, but can qualify and go out and get a loan because you've only got two years to get them cashed out. So no, no refinancing. Mm -mm. Okay. 